Good day. Today we'll be talking about fixed infrastructure asset management with a focus on valuation and registries. My name is uh, Tian Zening. I'm a lecturer with the University of Auckland and I'm looking forward to doing this presentation for you. So as a start, I just want to remind ourselves what the importance of fixed infrastructure assets are within our society. Now, nothing of this is news to you, uh, but it's always good to just remind ourselves of what the infrastructure function within our socio-economic situation is. It's certainly the backbone of our econo economic growth. It is central to how our communities live and work. And then it can, in some cases, be a very strong economic stimulant that's often used by government um, to stimulate the economy, to encourage spending when they release more jobs or when they need a little bit of cash perhaps to reduce investment on infrastructure. Regardless of what the situation is, uh, effective asset management of infrastructure has got significant implications for a country and it's therefore important for you also to realize what difference it can make to promote asset management within a country. I'm going to start with the overview of fixed asset management. And I just want to um, also give you a little bit of a glimpse of the different perspective on infrastructure asset management. One is from the accounting side, and then certainly the other one is from the engineering side. I will use that color scheme. So in some of the slides, you will see there's a purple color scheme for the accountant's view and then the blue one for the engineering view on the problem. But let's start with the official definition of infrastructure asset management. Now, there's two definitions uh, quoted there. The first one is from the International Infrastructure Management Manual. And the second one there from the ISO 55000 series. Now, some of the key words that we can pick up there um, is the required level of service that we want to maintain for our infrastructure in the most cost effective manner. We also see that ISO talks about a coordinated activity within organizations and to realize the value of the assets. So we're going to see how these two definitions has been expanded into the overall asset management process. Looking at the benefits that infrastructure asset management can bring to us, the first and foremost is that international research has indicated that we can get up to a 20 to 25% efficiency gain on our infrastructure. Now that efficiency gain is in two parts. Uh, first is uh, we can have a better performance for the same amount of investment, or we can maintain our current investment and get a better return um, on our condition. Secondly, we also know that if we maintain our network, it will also be resilient. Um, to shock events and to climate change and natural hazards. And then lastly, we're also going to have an improved level of service to our customer. So in summary, we can see there the list of the specific things that asset management help to achieve from effectiveness, efficiency, sustainability of our infrastructure long term, resilience improvements, and then certainly in terms of the um, adaptation and the ability for it to adapt to changing circumstances. This slide um, illustrate a number of points. Um, it was taken from the IBM business process review. And what we have here on the top is the asset management maturity that starts at an innocent level and then progress up to the point of excellence. Now, there are two scales on this uh, picture. The first one is 
that our maintenance and expenditure goes down and then our reliability and performance of our infrastructure can increase. So again, those are the two elements um, from the efficiency gain that I have spoken of before. What we then can see is how the approach to maintaining and investing into the infrastructure changes as you move along with that um, maturity in, in the processes. In the beginning, you would probably just repair things as they were before. Um, we're going to have a far more of a reactive process, which then goes into a far more proactive investment and really start to do optimized decision making as part of our investment planning process. So this figure is really um, useful in understanding the journey of implementation of uh, fixed asset management. I also would like to draw your attention to the timeline. This is something that you often don't achieve within a very short time frame. And this full journey is always estimated between um, one to five years, where I say within three years a country can achieve quite a bit in terms of their maturity in asset management. The next one is to look at the guiding principles of fixed asset management systems. The first one there, it is about preservation first. So the last thing that we want to do when we maintain asset is to focus on the worst first. So the parts of the network that's completely broken and, and, and decayed because we want to protect our investment. So preservation first. We also want to focus on the entire system, not individual projects. And therefore we will be needing some sophisticated um, software tools and systems to help us with that decision making. We want to maximize the return on our investment. It's often difficult to decide in asset management where to spend our money. And what we got to look at is where that investment is maximized in terms of the benefit return that it can give us. Now we can define that in different ways. It can be either performance or it can be in reducing risk. And then the last one is we want to make sure that it is sustainable because we want to leave our future generation with the same level of infrastructure that we had during our time here. What I'm going to do now is to take you a little bit through an explanation of what the asset management system consists of. The first one is that in our um, asset analytic process, we are really faced with balancing a number of needs that comes from our communities. So the first one is that we've got changing demographics, urbanization, and also the places where people settle. We got to understand our different customers and their specific needs. We know in most countries we've got an aging infrastructure that needs to be maintained. And then we've got an ever changing climate and natural hazards um, in our infrastructure. And we also have to allow for that. Now on the outside, you will see how sometimes the engineer sees the problem a little bit different to the accountants. Uh, the first one is that engineers would like to invest into infrastructure to make provision for these changes. Whereas the accountants see the opportunity of economic growth and revenue growth from providing for more customers. On the maintenance side of things, um, we would like to encourage more proactive investment uh, because obviously that is going to save us um, the maintenance going into the future. So we want to minimize the total cost of ownership on our infrastructure. In the same vein, we want to invest in our resilience of the infrastructure and hence um, saving the losses that we can incur from disastrous events. And there's a fine balance there because obviously we don't want to overinvest 
in our resilience either. At the bottom, we've got the most important factor in, in our eyes, of course, and that's to do with the um, investment. And we um, will look at it from an accountant or a treasury perspective, really in terms of financial strategies. And that is not only on the investment side, but also how we're going to balance that um, on the country's uh, ledger. And we want to make sure that the available funding is there. Um, to achieve in our infrastructure all the needs that we want to address. When we then look at the overall asset management process as defined by ISO 55000, uh, we see that it is um, divided in a number of um, areas. The first one is the asset management resources that we have, uh, the physical assets, the funding, and then also the work that we can complete. The next one is the asset management enablers. So these are all the things that makes the fixed asset management process possible. And that include the people, the processes and the technologies. The last one in, is then looking at the asset management service level, which is often a balance process between uh, providing for this required performance what it will cost, and then what are the risks as the outcome of that planning process. And then through this asset management process, obviously we deliver the outcomes in terms of our service provision from our infrastructure. Looking at the components of asset management and what it achieves, so we have listed here a number of things that the fixed asset management process will help us to achieve. Uh, you can read that. I'm not going to go through uh, those in a lot of detail. What I would like to focus on is really the components that we have in fixed asset management. So in terms of our main decision drivers, we are looking at the level of service that we want to give to our customers what the future demand is going to be. So that includes both population growth, but then also often the changes in demographics. There are quite a few countries in Asia in particular that have got issues with a aging population. So we've got far more older people that may not work any longer and fewer younger people that um, provide for income tax and then also having to look after the elderly. And you get a little bit of a shift in the terms of the types of assets that is needed given different demographics. Lastly, we also have to look at the risk, in particular the uh, risk to natural hazards, and then look at the long-term um, sustainability and climate adaptation over time. Now, in order to do the planning, we have to set the foundation being in good information and um, accurate information on our infrastructure. Two parts to that. First of all is we need to know the exact extent of our assets, how many we have, how long it is, and then also uh, what it is uh, performing as a functional performance and then how it's performing over time. That feeds into two processes. The first one is the life cycle management, which is more of an engineering decision process to really understand at what stage of the asset life should I be intervening. Obviously, I have mentioned before that we want to do a, or apply a principle of asset preservation first. So we are going to look at the um, maintenance and renewals at the early stages of infrastructure to keep it in a good condition as long as possible. When we then look at the financials, we got to first of all plan the expenditure side. So in terms of the life cycle management, how much is that going to cost for my respective intervention levels? And then also the revenue side of uh, things. Um, and that may include the fees or the charges, tariffs, the loans for capital investments, um, grants and fundings, and then the bonds that we can call on 
in order to finance some of these asset improvements. Now going through those uh, particular items in a slide or two, first of all, we're just gonna look at planning for demand. Now I have mentioned that demand has to do with population changes. Um, we also have to have a thorough understanding of the current capacity for our infrastructure and what the future changes may involve. Now from a financial or from a treasury's perspective, the population changes will put more pressure on our infrastructure, but at the same time promise us the opportunity of revenue growth. When we look at the um, infrastructure and the capacity we have to provide, we got to look at our financing options and what added value that investment is going to give us uh, that we spend on our infrastructure. With the future changes, obviously, we also need to understand the financial forecast of what those future changes will um, mean for us, both in terms of income, but also then in terms of providing the increased infrastructure needs. So the summation of that then result in the overall infrastructure gap. And in order to finance that, we have to develop our financial strategy which gives us the investment needs and then also the opportunity of uh, economic growth and new markets that some of these developments will result in. The next item we're gonna look at is life cycle management. And there I'm definitely gonna quote that good infrastructure cost list. Again, preserving our infrastructure is far more cost efficient than letting it deteriorate and then having to rebuild or to rehabilitate our infrastructure. On this figure and using road uh, networks as an example, we've got our infrastructure deteriorating over time and we have defined the condition in different buckets going from a failed infrastructure to excellent infrastructure when it's built new. An interesting fact about this condition deterioration is that for about um, two thirds of the life of my infrastructure, um, the condition drops by only 40%. And in that last third, it, it accelerates, the deterioration accelerates, and it costs a lot more to maintain if we defer our maintenance. Now, our maintenance interventions don't only depends on our life cycle costing aspects also. We have to look at our customers and their expectations on performance. We have to look at the safety because there are certain things in the water sector, in the transport sector that has got a safety concern if the asset deteriorates too much. And then obviously the last one is we also have to take account of our resilience or fragility of the infrastructure and the risk associated with a bad condition. So the overall decision drivers in this process is obviously the other investment or the available funding for this, uh, the timing of investment, and here we really try to optimize our um, overall investment over the life cycle. And then I have mentioned some of the other drivers for our investment process. Now I'm going to look at a level of service and, and really uh, by definition it is it's just easier to talk to uh, specific examples. Um, so the level of service examples include accessibility is how close and how easy is it for my customers to use my infrastructure that I provide, the quality or the quantity uh, the reliability of my infrastructure or the responsiveness, and then lastly, also the sustainability. And there are some specific examples under each one. Accessibility, and particularly in developing countries, is quite important. So we want to make sure that um, the entire population have got access to basic infrastructure needs. Uh, the quality and the quantity really depends on a number of factors 
and sometimes there could be legal um, requirements for something like the drinking water standards. Reliability is really how efficient and effective my infrastructure performs over time. And there we can think about um, the congestion on roads or the pressure in water pipes. And then sustainability is really that we, we try and have our infrastructure not causing too much harm um, to our environment and also in the long term um, economic sustainability for our communities. The next um, few slides I would like to emphasize the resilience, um, especially when it comes to natural hazards and would like to show the linkages between asset management and then the uh, management of our disaster and risk management processes. So we've got these uh, three circles, asset management, disaster management also um, to do with our financial strategies around risk um, cover and then the risk management process. And you can see where these areas intercept is where we get the opportunities um, of something being more resilient. For example, good asset management allows lower costs in risk uh, financing because there's more confidence in the management process. And then obviously through our asset management process, we can also result in our infrastructure being more resilient. Then the intercept between the management of disasters and the risk management really helps us with that understanding of um, the balance between say risk insurance and then the risk acceptance and then also um, maximizing the risk transfer based on our marketing um, market outcomes. Risk management and asset management intercept we will really try and minimize the risk by either reducing the likelihood of failure on our infrastructure. And if we can't do that, um, we would look at the consequences and try to minimize the consequences in an event of failure. When we then look at the fixed asset management process, we can see that the entire resilience process can be assisted through the asset management process. I have shown this um, illustration of the asset management process, which comes out of um, the International Infrastructure Asset Management Manual. And what I have indicated here in the different colors is some of the things that we can do prior to a event. Uh, to reduce the risk on our network, also be better prepared. There are some of the things in asset management that helps during an event and then obviously following an event, the asset management planning process and data that we contribute towards that process also helps a little bit in the planning processes. So the entire asset management process ultimately um, contributes significantly towards the overall risk and resilience of our infrastructure. That is, of course, in combination with all the financial decision and considerations that we have to take at the same time. To illustrate some of the processes that helps in improving resilience, I'm going to use an example of climate adaptation. Now, most of um, countries uh, do have a relatively good understanding in terms of the climate change risk and natural hazard risk. And I have also found that many countries already have a resilient improvement or a climate adaptation strategy in place. Now, to take that strategy and um, act on it, uh, we typically found the three different business processes that helps with that. The first one that um, we also know around the world that's well established is the disaster response planning and readiness. We also see that a number of countries is already employing um, some capital improvements into resilience 
and specific resilience initiatives. By integrating all of this into the asset management process, there's significant gains and again, the gains in terms of the appropriate information and data that is provided to the uh, decision processes. Uh, we've got the this, uh, prioritization of where to invest um, to make the most um, impact on risk reduction and then to plan future investment and consequences um, and balance that with some of the financing strategies that we've got on a network. So the asset management process in itself is, is a good vehicle to help us with resilience improvements. Now I would like to focus a little bit on depreciation and valuation. And then uh, starting out with just reminding you of some of the business processes in fixed asset management process that I've already spoken about. We see the foundation here being my asset knowledge, um, which is in my uh, inventory system or my asset registry. We've got our enablers that execute the asset management, including people and software systems. Our decision making, and typically these will sit in asset management software. Life cycle management, including life cycle cost analysis, uh, depreciation, valuation, and then also performance management. This then um, result in the life cycle delivery. So that is the way in which we deliver our infrastructure services. And it may include um, hiring a contractor to look after our network. Very important is that our asset management process can only be successful if we've got the institutional arrangement, the governance strategy, and also the legislative environment set up to do so. So that's particularly uh, for people from treasuries quite important to know that you've got a role to play um, in that area. And I will talk more about that in future slides. In terms of the asset valuation and, and practice, we've got a few guidelines around the world. The first one is um, the first uh, International Public Sector Accounting Standard Board, and then also the one from IPWA, um, which comes out of Australia and New Zealand. Now, the big question that we try to answer with this is what are the ongoing financial liabilities for our infrastructure? We often get that people plan the construction of infrastructure quite well, but what they often forget is the cost of maintaining that infrastructure. In the roads, as an example, 20% um, of the life cost is the initial construction cost and 80% of the cost is realized during the life of that um, road infrastructure. So through our asset valuation process, uh, we want to make sure that the funding is available for the entire life. We want to make sure that good decisions are being made and that we maintain the level of service. We certainly want to optimize that revenue and cost um, of the public assets, and we want to make sure that our infrastructure is sustainable. The last one is we also want to make sure that our infrastructure is aligned with our financial. We will now look at the classical uh, depreciation curve. And again, I would like to highlight the slight differences between the engineering view and the accounting view. And I think this is um, quite important uh, because they are different and uh, setting the right standards and approach is always important to make sure that the consistent approach is uh, followed through uh, between the different sectors. So again, you may be very familiar with this. I'll just summarize quickly. So we've got an asset going from new in a very good condition to being old and in a very poor condition when we got to start thinking of replacing it. 
Typically, and, and based on accounting, we will use a straight line depreciation that equates to the asset value at the different stages of the infrastructure's life. We also have the uh, depreciated amount and then a residual value that is defined at the end of the life. Now, this is perhaps where um, some of the um, different approaches um, comes forward. It's first of all, the definition around what is the end of life um, of an infrastructure component or an infrastructure grouping because that can be either economic end of life, functional end of life, or when the asset um, completely fails and cannot be used again. So again, we need to have um, that well defined uh, between the financial uh, standard lives and then what the asset managers see the practical life um, should be. There's also a little bit of a difference in terms of how assets deteriorate because if you think back about um, a few slides ago, our infrastructure don't always depreciate like this. We often get that in the beginning, it is slow to deteriorate and then um, rapidly deteriorate to the end. Again, the approach that we can follow um, could be either or, uh, but it is quite important that that is something that is fixed and well-defined practices uh, for a country. The other one to note is uh, whether we are looking at the capitalized value of infrastructure versus the replacement value. And I think this is often where we get that our infrastructure overall is undervalued uh, because although the infrastructure was constructed um, at, a diff at a certain cost, it does not mean when we replace it, we're going to replace it with uh, like for like. So we may need to replace it with something that uh, would cost more to build uh, because prices increase, but it also may be more um, infrastructure needs around it. So a wider road, a bigger pipe or an enlarged um, treatment plant. So once the asset has done its bit, um, that replacement value can sometimes be substantially more than what the capital, capitalized value will indicate. In terms of what we um, have to pay attention to is the common measures and units. Um, I've mentioned some of those. We have to be very specific about the assumed life of our infrastructure and then make sure that um, there's a consistent approach followed in the calculation and the um, application at an asset level. Also want to um, emphasize the fact that um, our data uh, that we use in our asset management process is an asset in itself and we have to um, use it and maintain it accordingly. What we find in most countries is that once um, a piece of infrastructure is designed and built, those plans um, go into a drawer or fall into the computer somewhere. But actually, it is a good idea to keep on using that same data throughout the life of that infrastructure so that we can plan the operation and renewals and maintenance um, far more effectively during the life cycle of our infrastructure. And use that to communicate the performance of our infrastructure over time. So again, our um, data registry and our database is as important sometimes as our infrastructure itself. So here is an example of a national asset registry. Um, I know that you're going to see a presentation about the Philippines um, also later today. So I won't go into this into too much detail. Uh, what we have here is the identified um, user requirements uh, for the NAR system. And I have indicated in purple the ones that from accountants or a treasury's perspective are perhaps more relevant and the ones in blue 
that's uh, perhaps primarily of relevance um, to the engineering. So we see things like our depreciation and valuation, everything to do with insurance, asset warranties, um, and the maintenance of lease. Um, the um, sale and renting of our infrastructure, fiscal planning and budgeting, and then certainly also um, the finance of post disaster reconstruction processes. So those would be the one that typically uh, for a treasury would be of most importance. What I would like to um, touch on now are the things that really um, treasury and central government can do to get asset management practices widely adopted within a country. So some examples in New Zealand, um, we used to have an infrastructure unit within our treasury department and their primary role was to set up two organisations that followed after them. The first one is our Minister of Finance is also the Minister of Infrastructure. So we do have a very close connection between the infrastructure and our financial department. There's also an independent infrastructure commission that advises the government on the national infrastructure strategy and investment into infrastructure. In South Africa, we've got the Treasury Department that um, created the City Support Program, which is a technical unit, an infrastructure unit to drive big best practice in the adoption of infrastructure asset management across uh, local councils. And as I said uh, later on, you're also going to hear a little bit more about what the Philippines has done. There in a similar veins, um, a number of oversight agencies have established a national technical asset management working group that was responsible for the development of uh, the asset management policy that was adopted and also the National Asset Registry. Some of the mechanisms that can be used to um, encourage the uptake of asset management um, may include something like uh, legislation. So we find legislation in New Zealand and in Australia, like the Local Government Act, that specifies that councils must declare their asset depreciation on an annual basis and that they are responsible that the overall asset value does not decrease over time. We could have national policies um, and a good example again of that was the uh, Philippines government asset management policy that was developed by the oversight agencies and is now enacted across a number of uh, the line departments. Some countries may be in a position to use the funding application process and the user requirements around that to drive good asset management. Uh, for example, some countries may have a dedicated road fund and if you want to invest in road networks, you've got to put a business case forward uh, for obtaining a certain level of funding. Lastly is we can also get a country where lead agencies um, would take on the charge, develop asset management, and then the others uh, learn from that. Uh, but in most cases, that would not be as effective as some of the more financial incentives to adopt asset management across the country. It is important to remember that when you adopt asset management processes uh, for a country, that it involves a number of institutional um, changes and a change management process. We often have the misconception that if you want to improve asset management, you buy a piece of software and that's going to fix your problem. And that is certainly not true. We will need the people that are skilled and can execute all the asset management tasks. We need the business processes to make sure that the um, asset management process is followed and that it's implemented on the ground. Yes, technology is a big part of that 
And it spans from the way that we collect data, the way we manage data, the analytics, and then also the reporting system. So you need to have an holistic approach whenever you look at implementing asset management across a country. To conclude, um, I'm just going to summarize some key messages. The first two there is really about understanding the value of our fixed asset to our community and how important it is to make sure that it is managed in the appropriate manner. In order to adopt asset management best practice, it needs to be steered from a national level, uh, from a central government level, and often treasuries are the best place to uh, facilitate that change management process across line agencies. And the implementation is not a quick fix. Uh, we often have a journey of a number of years that it will take before we reach the um, asset management practices that we aim for. We also have to employ the uh, proper asset valuation processes to make sure that our investment on our infrastructure is adequate. That is facilitated through uh, data registries and often as part of a national initiative, we've got to establish a central uh, data repository across all our asset groups. We also have to bring in our climate change uh, considerations because we know that in the future that is going to have a significant impact on the investment needs on our infrastructure. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you today and I hope that you found this presentation insightful. Have a good day.